What we've been talking about so far in the course are human universals, what everybody shares. So we've been talking about language, about rationality, about perception, about the emotions, about universals of, of development, and we've been talking about what people share. But honestly, what a lot of us are very interested in is why we're different. At the root of all human differences are two main factors. And so I want to talk about the two main interesting factors. Um, one is personality, the other is intelligence. And this is what, these are the differences I'll talk about today. First, from the standpoint of how do we characterize them, how do we explain them, and then from the standpoint of why these differences exist in the first place. Um, one way to characterize personality is in terms of people's style with dealing with, in dealing with the world, and particularly their style with dealing, in dealing with other people. So you take a simple character you know of, um, and you could talk about that person's personality, you could talk about in terms of being impulsive, irresponsible, sometimes lazy, good-hearted. Um, you could compare that person's personality with other people's personality, such as my colleague who gave a talk last class. He's wonderful. He's responsible and reliable and very kind. Um, and, and different from Homer. And so this difference is a difference in, in personality. Uh, now, when we talk about personality, we're talking about something else as well. We're talking about a stable trait across situations and time. So, if all of a sudden the person next to you kind of smacks you in the head, you might be angry. But we wouldn't call that personality because that's something that, that's the result of a situation. We'd all feel that way in that situation. It's personality if you walk around all the time, angry. There'd be a stable trait. It'd be something you carry around with you. Um, and that's what we mean by personality. Now, how do we scientifically characterize differences in personality? And it, it's a deep question. There's been a lot of attempts to do so. Um, any assessment has, any good assessment has to satisfy two conditions. And these are terms which are going to show up all over psychological research, but it's particularly relevant for this sort of measure. One is reliability. Reliability means there is not measurement error. And one crude way to think about reliability is a test is reliable if you test the same person at different times and you get the same result. My bathroom scale is reliable if whenever I stand on it, it gives me more or less the same number. It's not reliable if it's off by 10 pounds in the course of a day. Um, similarly, if I give you a personality test now and it says that you're anxious and defensive, well, and then give it to you tomorrow and it says you're calm and open-minded, it's not a reliable test. So reliable is something you could trust over time. Validity is something different. Validity is, um, is that your test measures what it's supposed to measure. Too few, but 16 might be too many. And there's a psychological consensus um, on what's been known as the big five. And the big five personality factors um, are these. And what this means is when we talk about each other and use adjectives, the claim is we could do so in thousands of different ways, but deep down we're talking about one of these five dimensions. This means that when a psychological test measures something about somebody, about their personality, if it's a good test, it's measuring one of these five things. And it means that as people interacting with one another in the world, these are the five things that we're interested in. Um, so one of them is neurotic versus stable. Um, is somebody sort of nutty and, uh, and worrying, or are they calm? Extrovert versus introvert. Um, open to experience versus close to experience. Agreeable, which is you know, courteous, friendly, versus non-agreeable, rude, selfish. And conscientious versus not conscientious. Uh, careful versus careless. Reliable versus undependable. Uh, a good way to think about these things 
is in terms of the, of the word ocean, O-C-E-A-N. Uh, the first letter captures openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And the claim is those are the four to five fundamental ways in which people differ from one another. Well, why should we believe this? Why should we take this theory seriously? Well, there's actually some evidence for it. Um, it seems to have some reliability in that it's stable um, over time. So if you test people over years, if I test your personality now on the five traits and test you five years from now, it will not have changed much. And once you pass the age of 30, it, it's very stable indeed. Um, if you think about your parents and then give mom and dad a mental test on where they stand on each of the five traits, 10 years from now, mom and dad will still be there. Um, it also seems to get agreement across multiple observers. History of attempts to define and measure intelligence. But there's just a couple of ideas I want to focus on. One is an idea developed by, by a Spearman, which is there's two types of intelligence. Um, there is G and there's S. S is your ability on specific tests. So if there's 10 tests that you're given as part of an IQ, an IQ test, 10 subtests, you'll get a different score in each of the subtests. There'll be a math test and a reading test and a spatial test, and you'll get different scores. G refers to a general intelligence, and the general intelligence is something you bring to each of the tests in common. So this is diagrammed here. You have these six tests. For each of them, there is an S, and then above that, there is a G. Now, G is a very important notion. The term G is used by psychologists a lot, even in casual conversation. You know, people say, so what do you think of him? And he has high G. And what you mean is, he's a smart guy. Why do you need G? Well, you wouldn't need G if your performance on each of these tests had nothing to do with each other. If the tests were genuinely separate, there'd be no general intelligence. But what people find over and over again is that when it comes to explaining people's performance on multiple intellectual tasks, there's two things going on. There's how good there is they are on a specific task, but then there's also a sort of general correlation that people bring to the tasks. And I could express this with an athletic analogy. Imagine I'm running a gym, and we, we have all of these different athletic tests. So we have a, a running test. We have a basketball shooting test, a swimming test, fencing, list of 10 of them. Now each of you go through each of the tests, and then you'll each get 10 scores. But what we'll discover is that the scores are not independent of one another. People who are good at one athletic thing tend to be good at another. Um, if there's somebody who's really good at running and swimming, odds are they're probably pretty good at climbing. Um, and the same thing holds for IQ, which is above and beyond how good people are at specific things, there seems to be a factor as to how well they are in general. And this factor is known as G. Now, there's a, again an extensive history of modern intelligence tests. Uh, and what's really interesting is the test now, what you need to know about the modern tests, the Weschler tests for both adults and children, is how they're scored. The way they're scored is that 100 is average. So it's just automatic. Whatever the average is, is 100. It's as if I did the midterm, graded the midterm, computed the average, gave everybody who got the average 100, said your score is 100. It's just the average. It works on a normal curve. And what this means is that it works so that the majority, 68%, get between 85 and 115 on their IQ tests. The vast majority, 95%, get between 70 and 130. Uh, if you um, 
are, say, above 145 IQ, which I imagine some people in the room are, um, you belong to 0.13% of the population. That's the way IQ tests work. Now, this is about IQ tests. We could now ask about their reliability and their validity. What do they mean? Well, this has turned out to be a matter of extreme debate. This just reiterates what I just said. Um, a lot of the debate was spawned by the book by Herrnstein and Murray about, called The Bell Curve. And in The Bell Curve, these authors made the argument that IQ matters immensely for everyday life and that people's status in society, like how rich they are and how successful they are, follows from their IQ as measured in standard IQ tests. Now, this book made a lot of claims, and, and it's probably before many of you, many of your time, um, but spawned huge controversy. And as a result of this controversy, some interesting papers came out. Um, one response to the Herrnstein and Murray book was by the American Psychological Association, which put together a group of 50 leading researchers in intelligence to write a report on what they thought about intelligence. What they thought about, does IQ matter? How does IQ relate to intelligence? How does, um, what's, what's the different, why are people different in intelligence? Why do different human groups differ in intelligence and so on? Um, at the same time, there was also another group of IQ research, researchers, not quite the same as the first group, got together and wrote another report. And if you're interested in this, the links to the reports are on the PowerPoint slide. Well, what did they conclude? The conclusions were slightly different, but here's the broad consensus by the experts. Um, regarding the importance of IQ tests, and the claim is, IQ is strongly related, more so, probably more so than any other single measurable human trait, to many important educational, occupational, economic, and social outcomes. In some cases, the correlation is very strong, such as um, success in school and success in military training. In other cases, it's moderate but robust, such as social competence. And in other cases, it's smaller but consistent, law-abidingness. And they conclude whatever IQ test measure, it is of great practical and social importance. So IQ matters. Um, more particularly, IQ matters for social achievement, for prestigious positions, and for on-the-job performance and other work-related variables. If I know your IQ score, I know something about you that matters. It's not irrelevant. Just as if I know your score on a personality test at a big five, I would know something about you that actually would tell me something interesting about you in the real world. On the other hand, there's a lot of controversy about why this connection exists. Um, so to some extent, people have worried that the effectiveness of IQ is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And here's why. If society takes IQ tests important, uh, seriously, they become important. So it's true that your IQ is very related to your success in getting into a good school, like Yale. But the reason for this, in large extent, is because to get to Yale, they give you an IQ test, the SAT. So um, same for graduate school. There's a GRE, which is yet another IQ test. So to some extent, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I could make, society could choose to make how tall you are extremely important for educational success. They could say, nobody under six feet tall gets into Yale. And then some psych professor would stand up and say, of course, height is profoundly related to educational accomplishment. And it would be, because people made it so. So to some extent, a society that draws highly on IQ tests um, regarding promotion and educational, educational achievement and military status and so on, um, it's just going to follow that IQ then becomes important. At the same time, however, the role of IQ is pretty clearly not entirely a social construction. Um, there's some evidence that your IQ score your, relates to intelligence in an interesting sense, including domains like mental speed um, and uh, memory span. So your, your, your score on IQ tests, for instance, is to some extent related to how fast you could think and uh, your memory abilities. 
Now we want to shift to the second half of the class and talk about why. So we talked about two differences, one in person one personality, one intelligence. I want to talk about why people differ. Okay. Why are we different? Well, you're different because of two things. Uh, your genes and your environment. Your nature and your nurture. Your heredity and your experience. This doesn't say anything. This is just defining the question. Um, but the question of the role of genes and the role of environment uh, in, in explaining human differences is an interesting one. And it could be explored in different ways. But before talking about it, I have to clear up a common misconception. I'm going to talk about the effects of genes. And I'm going to talk about heredity. But I want to be clear. I am talking about the role of genes and also the role of environment in explaining human differences, not in explaining human characteristics. So the distinction is we're interested in the amount of variation due to genetic differences, not the proportion of an individual's trait that's due to genes. So for instance, you could pull these apart. The question of um, when we ask what's the role of genes, what's the role of heredity in how tall people are? The question is not asking for you, what is the role of your genes in determining how tall you are? It's not clear it's even a sensible question. The question is, there's a height difference between you and me and him and her. How do we explain that difference? And I could illustrate why heredity doesn't mean the same thing as the contribution of the genes. Um, Height is reasonably heritable, meaning um, the differences between people in the population and how tall they are is due in large part, not entirely, but in large part to their genes. What about the number of legs people have? Well, the number of legs people have from zero, one, or two is actually not very heritable at all because almost everybody has two legs. And people who have fewer than two legs typically have lost one or both legs in an accident. It's not due to their genes. So of course, whether or not you have legs is a very genetic matter. But the differences in number of legs is, is not usually genetic. And so heredity is a claim about differences, not a claim about the origin of any specific trait. Well, now we, that's what heredity. A psychologist could estimate the extent to which variation of traits or attributes um, for any given population, uh, the, the extent to which that variation can be attributed to differences in genes. And I use that, that language, that specific language, because I was actually defining the term heritability. And you know, so a textbook might define the term heritability as the proportion of variation, so percentage, because a proportion is just a percentage, um, among individuals that we can attribute to genes, all right, due to genes. And so I know that even at this point, that definition is probably not very clear, and we're going to spend the entirety of this video just trying to clarify this concept. And so assume that we're talking about intelligence, and we say that heritability of intelligence is 50%, so IQ. And we've said that the heritability is 50%. And so what we're not saying is that the intelligence is 50% genetic. That's what we're not saying. Really what we are saying is that the difference in intelligence the difference in intelligence can be accounted for um, or is 50% attributable to the genetic differences. So we're talking about the differences in these traits. Because really to ask how much of our intelligence is mandated by our genome as opposed to instilled in us by our environment is completely inappropriate. And that's what we learned in that tea and hot water example. But what can be answered and what those twin and adoption studies started to show us um, is the percentage of the difference or variance right here that's attributable to the differences in genes. So I know I've said that several times and let me move it to an example. One of my favorite examples of heritability actually comes from Mark Twain, a famous author and comedian. And he said that suppose you raised four boys in barrels until they were 12 or so. So I've drawn some barrels here and we've got four boys inside of them. And you know, we'll feed them through a hole so that they get the same diet and such and we'll remove all of their waste products on the same schedule and their environments will be 100% controlled, almost sadistically controlled, but 100% controlled. By the age of 12, their IQs would probably be pretty uh, low compared to the, the population around them. But the, the kicker is that they're probably not all going to be the same, right? So the differences in their, in their intelligence couldn't be attributed at all to the environment because we've absolutely controlled their environment. And we would say that their IQ differences were nearly 100% heritable because their environments were nearly 100% the same. So. So H2 is just short for heritability, and we give it a lowercase because we're talking about one specific trait, in this case intelligence, as opposed to many traits. But the heritability would be close to 100%. And so that was Mark Twain's example of heritability. But alternatively, you could say that um, maybe you have four identical quadruplets with exactly the same genome, and you raise them in crazy different environments. And so maybe one is raised in a rainforest as a tribesman, and then maybe one is raised in a desert as a nomad. 
and then maybe one is raised in a North American family as you know maybe an industrial worker or at least in an industrial kind of blue collar family, and then maybe one will just say is raised in outer space. He's raised up here near the moon, maybe on the International Space Station. But the heritability of the intelligence of these four boys um, would be quite a bit lower because now their environments are accounting for a bigger percentage of the differences in their intelligence. And I've, I've said here that the heritability is actually zero percent because we've established that they're identical quadruplets, so genetically they're same, and their environments are completely different. So we would say that all of the differences in their intelligence must be attributed to their environments. So maybe you know a nice oversimplified way to think about this idea is that as the environment becomes more and more controlled, like in the example of the boys in the barrels, differences in behavioral traits are more closely tied to heredity, and the heritability of that trait is therefore higher. And then maybe another thing that might increase heritability would be increased genetic variation that leads to different phenotypes. So if, if there was more genetic variation in these boys, say maybe if they were fraternal quadruplets instead of identical quadruplets, and they had different uh, different genotypes and, and more genetic variation leading to different phenotypes or, or just the expression of their traits, those new variations would be uh, more related to their genes. So in this case, again, the heritability would increase. And so heritability is either increasing because genetics are contributing more to the genes or because non-genetic factors like the environment are contributing less. But what matters is that we're talking about the relative contribution of genes to the variation in, in behavior or traits. And so you might have just caught on uh, that heritability then becomes necessarily dependent on the population that's studied. And so think about one last time the population of boys inside the barrels. Their heritability is much higher, or the heritability of their IQ of it rather is much higher than it would have been if we had instead studied the quadruplets. So one last time, heritability of a trait is the extent to which variation can be attributed to genes, and it's very, very dependent on the populations and the environments that we study. But hopefully that just gives us a quick context for what we mean when we use this word in the future. Great. Well now, we, that's what heredity, which is genetic. Now we could talk about environment. And we could break up environment into two sorts of environment. One is shared environment. And shared environment is the extent to which the differences are caused by things, by phenomena that people raised in the same household share. So if one, suppose some of you are neurotic. And suppose we want to say part of that's due to your environment. Well, suppose you're neurotic because you have lousy parents. That would be part of your shared environment because presumably siblings raised in the same household would have the same lousy parents. This is contrasted with non-shared environment, which is everything else. Suppose I think you're neurotic because when you were five years old, somebody threw a snowball at you and it bounced off your head. That's non-shared environment. Suppose you're neurotic because you won the lottery when you were 21 and all the money messed you up. That would be non-shared environment. So what you have here is heredity, shared environment, and non-shared environment. And this equals one. That's everything. Non-shared environment is a sort of garbage can category that includes everything that's not heredity and not shared environment. Suppose you think you're neurotic because aliens from the planet Pluto are zapping your brain. Suppose you're right. Well, that would be non-shared environment, because they're presumably not necessarily zapping your siblings' brains. Everything else is non-shared environment. It becomes interesting to ask, for all these differences, the physical differences like height, but psychological differences like um, personality and intelligence, how do we parcel it out into what's genetic and what's environmental? Um, this proves to be really difficult in the real world. Because it's, in the real world, it's hard to pull apart genes and environment. So, um, so, so you and me will have different personalities. Why? Well, we were raised by different parents. And we have different genes. We can't tell. My, my brother and me might share all sorts of things in common. But we had the same parents. And the same genes, 50% of the same genes. So how do we tell what's causing us to be alike? So to, do, to pull these things apart, you need to be clever. You need to use the tools of behavioral genetics. Um, and to, to use these tools, you have to exploit certain regularities about genes and about environment. One thing is this. Some people are clones. Monozygotic twins are genetic duplicates. They share 100% of the same genes. That's kind of interesting. Dizygotic twins are not clones. They share 50-50. They're just like regular siblings. And adopted siblings have no special genetic overlap. That's 0% above and beyond randomness. Those three groups then become rather interesting. Um, Particularly when we keep in mind that by definition, 
two people raised in the same house by the same parents have 100% the same shared environment. So now we can start to answer these questions. Suppose you find that monozygotic twins are much more similar than dizygotic twins. Well, I would suggest that there's a large role of genes in those traits that you're interested in. It would not cinch the matter because there are other factors at work. For instance, monozygotic twins look more alike than dizygotic twins and maybe they have, different, they have more similar environments because of this similarity in appearance. Are monozygotic twins just as similar as dizygotic twins? If so, then it would show that that, that, over, that extra overlap in genes doesn't really matter. And so it would suggest a low role of heredity. Are um, adopted children highly similar to their brothers and sisters? If so, then there's a high role of shared environment. Suppose the Bloom children, um, and there's seven of them, all have an IQ of 104. And we adopt three kids. And then at the end of the day, those three kids each have an IQ of 104. That would suggest that, and we do this over and over again across different families, that would suggest that there's something about the Bloom family being raised by me that gives you an IQ of 104. <coughs> On the other hand, if the IQ of the adopted kids had no relationship to those of the biological Bloom children, it would suggest that being raised by me has no effects really in your IQ. It's sort of separate. A separate, a second, a, a final contrast, which is the thing that psychologists love is identical twins reared apart. That's the gold standard. Because you have these people who are clones, but they're raised in different families. Um, and to the extent that they're similar, this suggests it's a similarity of their genes. Two types of studies that are very important in the behavioral and social sciences, but are also important in the health sciences as well, are twin studies and adoption studies. And these studies are important because they can help researchers tease apart nature, our genes, our genetic code, and nurture our environment. So they can help us figure out what things we inherit from our parents, and what comes about through our interaction with our environment, where we live, our surroundings, our parents, our peers. So let's start off by talking about twin studies. And there are two types of twins, monozygotic twins, who are also known as identical twins, and dizygotic or fraternal twins. Monozygotic twins develop from a single fertilized egg. And I'll underline mono here because that means one. So we have one egg and we have one sperm and they come together, the sperm fertilizes the egg and then the egg splits into two. And because the egg splits after fertilization has occurred, monozygotic twins are genetically identical to each other. They share 100% of their genes. So identical twins don't just look the same. They have the same genetic code in every cell. Fraternal or dizygotic twins develop from two separate fertilized eggs. And here I'll underline di, which indicates two. So instead of one egg being released during a woman's cycle, two are released instead. And these two different eggs are fertilized by two different sperm. And as a result of this, fraternal twins share 50% of their genes. So fraternal twins have the same genetic relatedness as regular siblings. And just like you and your siblings, they might look alike, but they aren't going to be identical. But unlike regular siblings, both identical and fraternal twins are unique in that they share the same environment. First off, they share the same prenatal environment. They're exposed to the same things while they're in the womb. But twins are also raised by the same parents at the same time. They eat the same food and share the same toys and the same germs. And so we say that both identical and fraternal twins can be said to share 100% of the same environment, or at least as close as two people could possibly get. But what about regular siblings? Don't they share an environment? Sure they do. And it can be kind of hard to assess how similar their environments are, but it certainly isn't 100%. And you might think, no, that, that doesn't really sound right. Siblings are raised by the same parents. How different could their environments really be? And on the one hand, you're totally right. Siblings definitely have a more similar environment than they would with some random person on the street. But the environments of siblings can actually vary quite a bit. So for example, I have a younger sister, 
And I think my parents were way less strict with her than they were with me. I mean, I was their first kid. They didn't really know what they were doing. But they were much more prepared when she came around, and so they were much more relaxed. Also, my sister and I grew up in different places. I grew up in an apartment, but by the time my sister was born, we had already moved into a house. And while we may have gone to the same schools, we had different teachers and different friends. So while we certainly shared a similar environment, it is not as similar as we would see with twins. So let's say that you're a scientist and you're very interested in learning about what causes schizophrenia. Is it genes or is it something in the environment? Maybe a toxin that people with this disorder were exposed to in childhood. And one thing that you might have noticed in your past research is that children are more likely to develop schizophrenia if one of their parents has the disorder. And you might take that as an indication that there's a genetic component. And certainly there might be. But one problem with drawing this conclusion is that we're not sure about the effects of the environment. It's entirely possible that both parents and child develop schizophrenia, not because of any genetic component, but because there's some kind of chemical in their environment, maybe something in the water, that's actually triggering this disorder. And so what researchers want to do is to try to isolate genes and the environment, to try to look at one without the other, to see whether or not that will give us a clearer picture of what causes this disorder. And one of the ways that we can do this is with twin studies. So we could look at the rates of schizophrenia in both identical twins and fraternal twins. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to examine the effect of genes while the environment is held constant. So as we said, identical twins have 100% of the same genes and fraternal twins have 50% of the same genes, and they both share 100% of the same environment. So these two identical twins grew up in the same time in the same place, and these two fraternal twins grew up in the same time in the same place as well. So in this study, if schizophrenia was primarily caused by genes, you would expect to see different rates of the disorder in identical and fraternal twins. You would see that if one of these identical twins had schizophrenia, there would be a higher chance that the second twin would have it as well, at least higher than you would see in fraternal twins or regular siblings. However, if schizophrenia was more of a factor of what environment someone had been exposed to, we would expect to see similar rates of the disorder in both sets of twins, because it is likely that each set of twins was exposed to the same environmental effects. So if something within that environment caused the disorder, both sets of twins would have interacted with it. It wouldn't make a difference whether or not they were identical or fraternal. So to review, if identical twins, who share 100% of the same genetic material, resemble each other more than fraternal twins, who share 50% of the genetic material, then we would conclude that that trait or disorder or behavior had a strong genetic component. However, just like with every study methodology, there are some problems with twin studies. For example, it's possible that identical twins are treated more similarly than fraternal twins are, and this could have some kind of unexpected effect. And so even though both identical and fraternal twins share more of their environment than regular siblings, it is possible that identical twins share even more of the same environment than fraternal twins do. Another type of study that can help us tease apart nature and nurture are adoption studies. In these studies, individuals who have been adopted are compared to their adopted families and their biological families. So sticking with our schizophrenia example, if rates of schizophrenia in adopted individuals resemble the rates seen in their biological family but not their adopted one, then we would conclude that there is a strong genetic component. But if we find that there is no relation between an individual and their biological parents, but that there are similar rates for adopted children and their adopted parents, then we would conclude that environment plays an important role. So because adopted individuals are exposed to different environments from their biological relatives, their genetic relatives, it makes it easier for scientists to tease apart genetic and environmental effects. But there are problems with this methodology as well. Because a child has been adopted, we might have incomplete information about their biological families. Also, placement for adoption is not random. Children are not just randomly handed to any member of the population. And some agencies might even try to match individuals with an adopted family that is similar to their biological family in terms of community and culture. And this can make it more difficult for us to determine whether or not something is genetically driven or environmentally driven. 
So we have twin studies and we have adoption studies, but it's also possible for these two types of studies to be combined. In some very rare cases, identical twins are put up for adoption and they're each adopted by different families. So we have two people who are genetically identical, but they are being raised in different environments. And you can see why this would really be an ideal situation for scientists in terms of studying the underlying effects of nature and nurture. Using our schizophrenia example, if it was primarily caused by genes, if it had a strong genetic component, you would expect to see similar rates of the disorder in both identical twins raised apart and identical twins raised together. But if it was mainly driven by the environment, you would not expect to see the same rates within these two twin populations. But once again, we have the problem that adoption isn't random. In fact, families that adopt tend to be very similar to one another. They tend to be wealthy because adoption is very expensive, but they also clearly want a child and they're really going out of their way to get one. And this might result in these families having similar parenting styles. And so even though these two identical twins might be raised by different families, their environments might not be as different as researchers would like. So to review, if something has a strong genetic component, whether it's a behavior or a trait or disorder, we would expect to see more similarity between identical twins than fraternal twins. We would expect to see no difference between identical twins raised together and identical twins raised apart. And adopted children would have more similarities to their biological families than their adopted families. But if something is environmentally driven, then we would expect to see no differences between identical twins and fraternal twins. We would also expect to see closer rates in identical twins raised together, closer than we would see in identical twins raised apart. And we would expect adopted children to have rates closer to their adopted families as compared to their biological families. Um, and in fact, one of, the, one of the most surprising findings in behavioral genetics, um, the caption here is, separated at birth, the Malifer twins meet accidentally and they're at a patent office with the same device. Um, one of the hugely surprising findings from behavioral genetics is how alike identical twins reared apart are. They seem to have similar attitudes to the death penalty, to religion, and to modern music. They're, they have similar rates of behavior in crime, gambling, and divorce. Um, they often have been found to have bizarre similarities. They meet after being separated at birth, and they meet at age 30, and then it turns out that they both get into a lot of trouble because they pretend to sneeze in elevators. Um, there was one, one pair of twins studied by um, behavioral geneticists were known as the giggle twins, because they were both would always giggle. They burst into giggles at every moment, um, even though it couldn't be environment because they weren't raised together. Um, more objectively, the brain scans of identical twins reared apart show that their brains are so similar, in many cases, you can't tell whose brain is who. I could tell your brain from my brain from a brain scan, and my, my brother's brain from my brain from a brain scan. But if I were to have an identical twin, it would be very difficult to tell whose brain is whose, even if we had no environment in common. So this leads to two surprising findings of behavioral genetics. This is the first one. There's high heritability for almost everything. Um, for intelligence, for personality, for how happy you are, for how religious you are, for your political orientation, there, for your sexual orientation, there is high heritability. There's a high effect of genes for just about everything. Now, that's actually not the controversial thing I'm going to tell you. But before getting to the more controversial thing, um, I want to raise another issue which often gets discussed and has a good treatment in a textbook. Um, this suggests that individual differences within, this, within a group have genetic causes. Does that mean that group differences are largely the result of genetic causes? So we know that there are clear differences in IQ scores among American racial groups between whites and Asians, African Americans, Ashkenazi Jews. There's clear and reliable IQ differences, as well as some other differences. Now, to some extent, these groups are partially socially constructed. Um, and what this means is that whether or not you fall into, into a group, 
um, is not entirely determined by your genetic makeup. It's often determined by social decisions. So whether or not you count as a Jew, for instance, um, depends not entirely on genetic factors, but also on factors such as whether um, you're reform or orthodox, and whether you, so whether you would uh, accept uh, that a child of a Jewish man and a non-Jewish woman is Jewish. Um, similarly, categories like African American and white and Asian often overlap broad genetic categories, and they don't make fully coherent genetic sense. At the same time, though, there's plainly some genetic differences across human groups, and um, say with regard to vulnerability to disease. Ashkenazi Jews, for instance, are vulnerable to Tay-Sachs. And the fact you could have this sort of genetic vulnerability suggests that there's some sort of reality to these groups. So you have to ask the question now, to what extent does the high heritability in individuals uh, mean that there has to be a heritable explanation across groups? And the answer is, not at all. I'm not saying that this means that there's no genetic explanation for human group differences. All I'm saying is the question of the phenomena of within group genetic differences does not mean that there's a cross group genetic, sorry, between group genetic differences. Um, there's a nice example by Richard Lewinton, the, the, the geneticist, um, where he imagines two plots of, um, what is some sort of a wheat? Yeah, two plots of land. And each one has a set of seeds. And, oh no, they're over here. No, they're, anyway. One of them you fertilize a lot. The other one you fertilize a little. Now within each plot, how much the seed grows is actually largely determined by the genetics of the seed. And so you'd find high heritability for growth in the seeds. But the difference between groups has no genetic cause at all. It's caused by which groups you fertilize more than others. Here's another way to do, to, to do the logic. Suppose from the middle down here, you guys, I hate you. I, I really hate all of you. And I like you. So I make up two midterms. You probably didn't notice, but there are two midterms. This midterm was fiercely hard, savagely hard. It took many of you to end the class to do it. This midterm was, you know, which is bigger, a dog or an elephant? Because <laughs> I, I like you, and I want you all to succeed. Now, so you have two different groups, you guys and you guys. Within each group, some people are going to do better than others. The explanation for that might actually have to do with your genes. It might have to do with your environment, how much you study, but all sorts of reasons for that. But within each group, some of you will do better on the hard test than, than others on the hard test, some better on the easy test. Than, 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 than others on the easy test. But how do we explain the group difference? Well, it has nothing to do with genes. The group difference, the fact that you will do much worse than you, has to do with the exams I gave. My point, again, is that there's a logical difference between a within group difference, within this half of the class, and a difference between groups, within, between this group and this group. What do we know about, so that just shows they're not the same thing. But what's the fact of the matter? What do we know about human differences uh, between different human groups? Again, the textbook has a good discussion of this. But um, I'm going to uh, give two reasons from the textbook that at least group differences are at least to a large extent due to environmental and not genetic causes. One is that the differences we find in IQ seem to correspond better to socially defined groups than genetically defined groups. They seem to, to correspond to groups defined in terms of how people treat you and how people think about you as opposed to your DNA. And to the extent that turns out to be true, that would mean that, that a genetic explanation is not reasonable for those differences. A second factor is that we know IQ can differ radically without any genetic differences at all. And the most dramatic evidence of that is the Flynn effect. The Flynn effect is one of the freakier findings. The Flynn effect is the finding that people have been getting smarter. You are much smarter, on average, than your parents. Um, if, and the IQ tests hide that. Here's why they hide that. 
They hide that because they always make 100 the average. So you come home and say, Dad, Dad, I just did an IQ test. I got 120. And your father says, good work, son. I got 122 when I was your age. But what neither of you acknowledge is your test was much harder. As people got better, they had to make the test harder and harder. And this is plotted by the Flynn effect. Um, one of these lines is, um, one of these lines is American, one is Dutch. I don't know which is which. But the gist of it is that, um, that somebody who would have, that if you in 1980 would take the 1950 test, your average person in 1980 would score 120 on the 1950 test. What this means is you take your, your person who's average now and push him back through time 20 years, 30 years, um, he would do much better than average. Nobody knows why people are getting smarter. Um, and there's different theories of this. And in fact, well, wait till you see your reading response. But, but what this illustrates is that IQ can change dramatically over the span of a few decades without any corresponding genetic change. And that leaves open the possibility, in fact, maybe the likelihood, that the differences we find in human groups, existing human groups, are caused by the same environmental effects that have led to the Flynn effect. Okay, this is not the surprising claim, though, the high heritability for almost everything. This is the surprising claim. Almost everything that's not genetic is due to non-shared environment. The behavioral genetic analyses um, suggest that um, shared environment counts for little or nothing. When it comes to personality or intelligence, then an adopted child is no more similar to his siblings than he or she is to a stranger. To put it a different way, the IQ correlation between genetically unrelated adults who are raised in the same family is about zero. Suppose the Bloom family all has an IQ of 104, and we adopt a kid. What will this kid's, we adopt him as a baby. We raise him to be a 20-year-old. What's his IQ? Answer, we have no idea. Because the IQ of the Bloom family, who are unrelated to him, has no effect at all. Now, if you think about the implications a bit, it becomes controversial. Um, and Newsweek, I think, caught the big issue when they, when they put in their title a question, do parents matter? And the question, and the issue is, parents are shared environment. To say shared environment does not affect your intelligence or your personality um, suggests that, that how your parents raised you does not affect your gene, your, your intelligence, or your personality. This isn't to say your parents didn't have a big effect um, on, your, on your intelligence and personality. Your parents had a huge effect on your intelligence and your personality, around 0.5, actually. They had this effect at the moment of conception. From then on in, they played very little role in shaping you what you are. So we studied 250 children who were adopted away at birth from their mother, their adoptive parents, and then matched control parents. These are control parents who share genes and environment with their children. So we studied them year after year, when they're you know, seven, then when they were 16 and 20s, and now they're in their 30s. So we studied lots of things. One is cognitive development, that is, intellectual development of children in terms of cognitive abilities and also general cognitive ability, which most people call intelligence. So the fact that control parents are similar in IQ to their children could be all nurture, could be all nature, could be some of both. That correlation is almost identical to the correlation of control parents and their children. So that even though they share no nurture with those children, they are just as similar to their children at 16 years of age, 21 years of age, as the control parents are with their children.
Were you surprised when you... you... Well, I was, I was surprised that there was so little evidence for nurture, but then the, 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 the real killer fact is the other side of this. What about the adoptive parents? So they raised the kids from the first month of life. And, you know, they were screened for being good parents. They're generally able to provide everything the child needs. Their correlation with their children's IQ is zero. Wow. Doesn't correlate at all. So it doesn't really matter what they did if they read for these children, if they tried to stimulate them intellectually? Didn't well, have any effect? Well, the brighter adoptive parents didn't have brighter adopted children. That's what that tells you. Why do brighter parents have brighter children? Could be nature or nurture. The answer is nature. But this goes against everything I learned when I studied sociology. Yeah. Where uh, I was told that children imitate their parents. They, this it, you know, it's a, a perfectly reasonable hypothesis. But it's wrong, huh? It's wrong because they didn't take genetics into account. So, you know, if you don't take genetics into account, you can, you can easily explain everything environmentally. If you take a child who's shy, for example, you get one of two answers if you ask the parent, why is your child shy? And it's either, I took her out too much when she was young, or I didn't take her out enough when she was young. Then when you get the second child and you say, whoa, you know, I, I might have taken the first one out too much when she was young, but we did the same thing with the other one, and look, this one isn't shy. So it's said that um, parents are environmentalists until they have more than one child. <laughs> I think the man on the street's a lot wiser about these things. I think the problem is academics. You know, people in their ivory towers who don't have children especially, they're the ones who have these preposterous theories that everything's environmental. Okay. Yeah. The professor said that, oh, he'd guess about 80% is due to social influences. Well, I'm not guessing. I'm saying about 50, 60, 70% is due to genetic differences. If parents don't have any effect on children, but there's still, there's still an environmental effect, what, what is that env environmental effect? That's the big question. Now, Judith Rich Harris wrote a very important book called The Nurture Assumption, which addresses these issues. The case for this, which generated a Newsweek cover, came up in a controversial book by Judith Harris called The Nurture Assumption. Um, which has a very long subtitle, why, parents turn, why Children Turn Out the Way They Do, Parents Matter Less Than You Think, and Peers Matter More. Um, Judith Harris has had an, intellectu an interesting history. Um, she was kicked out of graduate school at Harvard um, and told that she wouldn't amount to much. The person who wrote the letter saying that she was not going to amount to much was the department chair, George Miller. Um, in 1997, she won the George Miller Award for her astounding <laughs> accomplishments. Um, and when she wrote the book, she took as a starting point her point of disagreement, a famous poem by the poet Philip Larkin. And many of you have probably heard this. The poem goes like this. They fuck you up, your mom and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you. Um, the last line of the poem, the last uh, uh, bit of the poem ends. Man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can and don't have any kids yourself. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, Harris wrote a rebuttal. How sharper than a serpent's tooth to hear your child make such a fuss. It isn't fair, it's not the truth. He's fucked up, yes, but not by us. Hello. Hello, I'm Harold Aya. Nice to meet you. I'm very glad to meet you. What a beautiful day. It's cold though, isn't it? Yeah, I but I guess the... that doesn't bother you being from Norway, right? <laughs> no, for me it's like summer. <laughs> <laughs> they just go on saying these things year after year and they never pay any attention to the evidence. Parents don't have that influence on children. Parents are very important to children. But that doesn't mean that they have long-term effects on how the child behaves and how the child thinks. The reasoning is, what's the goal of childhood? The goal of childhood is to pre prepare the child to be a successful adult. Well, a successful adult does not have to get along well with his parents, does he? He's left his parents behind. He's an adult now, right? 
What he has to do is make a good impression on his peers. He has to find something he's good at. He has to find people he gets along well with. And this is his future. Parents are the past. The people who influence the teenager are the child's peers. But what causes them to get addicted is genetic influences on their tendency to, um, to get addicted to substances such as, as nicotine. And, and that, it, that's what they inherited from their parents. And it's not because they see their parents smoke and no. copy their parents? No. Yes, I would agree that there are certain environments that are so horrible that nobody could come out of them intact. But it, we're talking about normal families, okay? With the, the 95, 97% of families in which the environment isn't that horrible. What we've learned from genetics, I think, about the environment is that the environment isn't out there. We select environments. We even create environments. So children, say, who aren't music in a musical environment, who are really into music, you can't stop them from thinking about music in their heads or banging on pots or hanging out with other kids. You almost have to lock them in a closet to stop them from developing their talent. Differences are good. It's what genetics is about. It's the spice of life, all of that. And so as a parent, then, I think if you respect those differences, what you do is instead of imposing your own will, my child will be a musician or a chess player or something like that, give your child lots of opportunities and find out what they're better at and what they enjoy. I think everyone will be happier. Children will be happier, will be happier. And that's not a bad thing. Um, just to show that academic debates never end, um, a British psychoanalyst named Oliver James, James, outraged by Judith Harris's book, The Nurture Assumption, wrote another book in response called They Fuck You Up. <laughs> um, now, how do you tell your grandparents, I wrote a book, what's it called? Can't tell you. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, look, if you're paying attention, this has to sound wrong. You must be thinking, of course there must be an effect of shared environment. Of course parents have an effect. After all, good kids have good parents. There is no doubt at all that this is true. There's a high correlation between parent and child for everything. If your parents read a lot and there's a lot of books in your house, you will become a reader. Um, if your parents are religious, you will be religious. If, um, you're, if you're raised by Bonnie and Clyde, you will be a young thug. Uh, if your parents are poor, you're likely to be poor. If your parents are brilliant, you're likely to be brilliant. No doubt at all. It is extremely robust correlation. But the problem is this correlation could be explained in different ways. Everybody thinks it's because parents do something that affects their kids. Your parents are bookish, they read to their kids, so their kids become bookish. Um, but another possibility, which we know is true, that almost always parents share their genes with their kids. Another possibility is, it's the parents who are affecting, sorry, it's the child who's affecting the parents, not vice versa. And to illustrate this, um, these different possibilities, I want to tell you a little bit about a study. And I really find this a fascinating study. It was reported last year. Um, and it was a study shown that suggested that family meals help teens avoid smoking alcohol drugs. It involved a phone questionnaire where they phoned up teenagers and their parents that said, hey, teenager, do you do a lot of drugs? Uh, yes. Do you have a dinner with your parents? No. Mm -hmm. And they take it off. And then they ask other people. And they find that the, the kids who are the good kids have meals with their parents suggesting this headline. I like this study because I have read, I must have read in my career a thousand studies. And this is the worst study ever done in the history of science. Um, and, and it's almost, we could, devote, we could devote a week to discussing what's wrong with this study. Let's just, but, but here's the idea. It is possible that they are right. 
It is actually possible, and there's no, I have no evidence against it, that having meals with your kids makes them into good, drug-free, non-promiscuous, non-drinking kids. Of course, it's equally possible, it's the other way around. If, if little Johnny um, is kind of, is, is out there smoking pot and, and cavorting with prostitutes and, 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 and stuff like that, he's not going to come home for the family meal. It's the other way around. Well, if he's a good kid, he might be more likely to have a family meal. So the direction, it might actually be not family meals make good kids, but ri rather good kids stick around the house, they have nothing better to do, and they have meals with mom and dad. <laughs> Another possibility is there's good families and bad families. A good family is likely to have drug-free kids and a family meal. A bad family is likely to have stone kids and no family meal. <laughs> so there, maybe there's an effect that, of the parents that has nothing to do with the family meal. Here's the even weirder part. They didn't factor out age. So think about this. Their sample included children ranging from 12 to 17. But let me tell you something about 12-year-olds. 12 12-year-olds, 12 don't use a lot of drugs and likely to eat with their family. 17-year-olds are stoned all the time and they don't eat with their family. Um, I've just begun on this study. Uh, but the point is, when you hear something like, so now take something which you may be more likely to believe. Um, maybe you believe that having parents who read to their kids, that's good for their kids. Well, maybe it is. But most of these criticisms apply to that study, too. A bookish kid is more likely to get his parents to read to him. A good family, a, 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 a parents who are good parents in general, are more likely to, to do all sorts of good things to their kids and have good kids besides. Take another case, the, the so-called cycle of violence. Yes, it's true. Parents who smack their kids tend to have, statistically, more violent kids, but maybe the causality goes the other way around. Maybe if you have a kid who's a troublemaker, you're more likely to smack him. Maybe, which seems to be entirely likely, the propensity for violence is to some extent heritable. And so even if the, if the kid was not raised by the smacking parent, whatever properties of that parent caused him, led to that violence, got inherited by the kid. Now again, this isn't going to sit right for you. And I've had, I put this down because last year when I gave this talk, people ran up to me and told me this. They said, look, I know my mom and dad had a huge role in my life. That's why I'm so happy and successful. Then other people said, that's why I'm so miserable and screwed up. <laughs> but either way, blame it on mom and dad or thank mom and dad. And you might think you know. When you become famous, you stand up and you get your rewards, maybe you'll thank your mom and dad. When you go to your therapist and explain why you're so screwed up, maybe you'll blame it. He never took me to a baseball game. Well, maybe. Maybe. But you don't know. Were you adopted? If you weren't adopted, you can't even begin to have the conversation about how your parents messed you up. Because if you're a lot like your parents, you might be a lot like your parents because you share their genes. Of course you resemble your parents. Um, moreover, how do you figure out which is the cause and which is the effect. Now, mom smacked me a lot, and that's why I turned out to be such a rotten person. Well, maybe she smacked you because you were rotten. I mean, no, I don't want to get personal. But it's very difficult to pull these things apart. Um, a final point on this. One, one response to Harris's book is this. Look, even if this is true, you shouldn't let this get out. Because if parents don't mold their children's personalities, maybe why should they treat their kids nicely? And you might be wondering this. You might be thinking, well, gee, if you don't have any effect on how your kids turn out, um, why be nice to them? But there are answers. You might want to be nice to them because you love them. You might want to be nice to them because you want them to be happy. You might want to be nice to them because you want to have good relationships with them. And I have a little bit more, but I'm going to skip it. And I'm going to move right to your reading response, which is very, very simple, easy to, easy to answer, easy to grade. Explain the Flynn effect. It's, it's a toughie, so just explain that. Um, OK, have a wonderful spring break, and I'll see you when you get back. <laughs>